Hey, Pastor Don Spivey here. Thanks so much for tuning in today and downloading or streaming this message. I pray that the Lord uses it to grow you in your faith. Here's a couple of things I want to run by you before we get started. First off, I pray that as you consume this material, it will be a supplement to your growth in the Lord. I also pray that you won't use it as a replacement for gathering together with your church family in person for worship. Secondly, if you are looking for a church home, I'd love to meet you and answer any questions that you might have. You can text the word online to 352-822-3878. That's online to 352-822-3878. Now friends, as we listen to God's word being preached, my prayer is that our hearts will be stirred. Our love and affection for Jesus will grow deeper and deeper. That's my prayer for you and for myself. God bless you. Have a great day. According to my mom, I've been an educator since I was seven because I was teaching my dolls. Um, but certified, I've been, I've been an educator since 2003 where I started in Orange County um, as a chemistry, physics, a science teacher. Um, and then I moved over here to Lake County, loved it, and was hired by our love, our mentor, Miss Cole, over at East Ridge High School, where I remained there for 14 years and taught AP Chemistry. Um, and then my child was struggling, and it was time for me to step out of the classroom. And I was at the district office for, I think, about three years as a program specialist for new teachers. And um, new teachers, I did prevention, bully prevention, um, drug, dating, violence, all of those type of prevention things. And then I had a call, a strong calling to go into administration. So then I started at East Ridge Middle as a AP for 2017. And then I guess the Lord saw it fit that <laughs> in 2021, I become the principal of Groveland Elementary. So I've been in for a while. <laughs> yeah, nothing going on in 2021. Nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> That's great. Ms. Trana, how, how long have you been an educator? And well, I started when I was 12. Um, because I'm now entering my 27th year. <laughs> so, you know, looking pretty good for 39, yeah. wouldn't you there say, you right? Um, so, no, I have been, I feel like education has called me. I haven't, you know, sought out education. It has definitely, you know, been something that has been part of my whole life. Um, I started in Orange County also as an athletic trainer and PE teacher at Colonial High School, and I was there for nine years, and then was hired by Miss Cole at Eastridge High School, and I was at Eastridge High for 14 years, serving in various roles, athletic trainer, athletic director, assistant principal, and then just really feel blessed with the opportunity to lead Gray, and I'm entering my third year at Gray as the principal. Very good. So uh, you started to answer another question I wanted to ask. So why? That's the question. Why, why did you come into this role, and the same question for all of you. So as an athletic trainer, you know, sports was my first love. And, you know, helping athletes to, you know, over or overcome adversity and injury. Um, part of our undergraduate program, they really encouraged us to become teachers. And I was like, nope, I'm not going to be a teacher. I'm not a teacher. I'm an athletic trainer. And it's really funny how God knew more than I did. Uh, because my first job was in a school, and to think that I have been in a school since I was four years old, you know, that there's never been a time that I haven't been in a school. So it's just been, you know, a journey and a blessing from God to really <coughs> mold and shape not only children but adults now too. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, mine is very similar. I really thought I was going to school. My degree is in biochem. I did everything for pre-med, and um, I it was I had very instrumental people, teachers in my life um, growing up because I was kind of um, one of those latchkey kids. Parents are at work, and I um, was either before school, after school, or parents were going through something, and teachers took me in. So in my senior year, I was like, you know what, God, you're right. I'm going to give back. So my whole thought was, oh, I'm going to do three years, get my med stuff together. And when I tell you I fell in love with it, I realized that I am somebody's el somebody else's inspiration like my teachers were for me. And they just kind of just continued. I, I, that The love of learning it, it is one place where I can just be just to consistently learn and then give of myself to others who, not just students, but now I can give it to teachers and families and community. So it's just been, it's, it's been a wonderful ride when you let go and let God have his way. Let 
go and let God have his way. Coach. Well, yeah, God pointed me in a direction of education at 42 years old. Um, I was the oldest person to graduate at UCF that night. And uh, Coach O'Leary was still the coach there back in 2004 when I graduated, and he recruited me in high school. Uh, I had no business going to college. I grew up on the, uh, um, in a really tough area and then moved to a very uh, wealthy area. So I took my criminal behavior there. Where I learned to be an educator was when I worked at a juvenile detention center in, in, in Beverly, Massachusetts um, for inner city gang kids from Boston. And uh, I was very familiar with that. It was easy for me because I had attended that school when I was in seventh grade. Um, it, uh, I missed seventh grade, uh, went to juvie, and uh, learned a lot from the, the street kids, and w got in a career in the restaurant business, and my wife uh, does very well, and at 41, she said, go back and get your college degree, because it really irks you that you played four years of college football and never got a degree. So I did, and I went back and got it in education, was hey, fortunate. Coach, coach yeah. did you go to Alabama and not get that degree? I'm just wondering. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a Florida State fan. Uh, maybe yeah. you went to the University of Florida? Yeah. Oh, okay. My bad. All right. Well, my, my bad. My bad. I, I'm old. I opened the carrier dome. <laughs> so that, that was a long time ago. But um, make a long story short, I got into it. Uh, was at Olympia for a year under a real good coach, Bob Head. Um, my daughters went to Foundation Academy. They begged me to come there. I went there, became a history teacher, an APU history teacher, uh, the history department head, and uh, their head football coach for 16 years. Um, my daughters wish that I never was there when the, they were in high school, though. Um, but uh, what a, the, the biggest thing that I saw education-wise was this past year at the Nike Coach of the Year Clinic. I was going to go see James Franklin speak at Penn, from Penn State because he's really awesome. He's inspirational. He gets everyone fired, fired up. And I've seen him speak before. And then there was a little small seminar on coaching today's athletes. And I think this is where we need our prayers. Okay. That's going to take me into the next okay, question for you. Okay, good. Um, no, you can keep it there. All um, right. What are some things that we can be uh, – what are some needs you guys are seeing in the schools – and how could we as a congregation um, partner with you uh, in some of those needs? And so if you could. I'll do it quick because they've been in, at it longer than me in the, okay. the public school system, and they, they're teaching me. But uh, Billy Graham says a coach will impact more lives in one year than the average person will be in a lifetime. And I'm not going to say it's just a coach. It's a teacher. It's a principal. I have never seen school workers work as hard as they have since I've been at South Lake High School in February. These people are around the clock, they're doing God's work. Um, teaching post-COVID and coaching post-COVID, it's a different game. We can't say, well, we did it this way in the old days. It, it's a new kid, it's a new way of teaching, and we're all learning. So if you could pray for us with guidance, protection over the youth and protection and, and guidance for our administrators and teachers, I think that would be a huge thing for us. Absolutely. Ditto. Um, our number one, and that was my number one, is prayer. Even though we don't see you and you're not side by side, I know I can speak for all of us. We feel the prayers. Anytime you think of our schools, we just ask that you lift everyone up, even our school board, because they're making the decisions that fall down on all of us. And we, as we know, everything falls downhill because of gravity, right, but or other reasons. And I don't want, I don't want anything to fall on our children. So when it becomes hard on us or teachers, it then kind of filters out into the classroom. So prayer is huge. Like that is the one thing I think all of us can do in order to just continue to ask for strength and a hedge of protection wrapped around all of us at the school because of all the things that are happening outside. And I just thank God for those things. 
other things that we are asking for at Groveland, if you have time, we were asked that you become a volunteer. We love people coming on campus in order to assist teachers with whatever, putting posters up, putting things together, even if we have to send them home. That will be an awesome piece, either on campus or off. But those of you that have any type of landscaping, we are working on our landscaping on um, our campus. We need hands in doing, um, we're trying to do community gardens. So those type of volunteering piece, and of course we will always take monetary things that we can do for our students and our teachers on campus. But any type of works that you have as well, we welcome all of those things. This is the hard part about going last, is because you're right, you're like, okay, what they said, what they said. Right. Yeah. Um, so. From Gray's perspective, I feel that, you know, we definitely benefit from your prayers. Prayers not only for the adults in the building, but for the students as well. Um, unfortunately, we've had some recent uh, instructional openings that have come up unexpectedly, and so we really need your prayers for the right people to enter our space. So we feel like, um, you know, the culture of our school is very important, and so bringing people who are, have a passion and a heart for children um, and working together. And then we would also appreciate uh, volunteers. We have some things going on with our positive behavior support system where we need adult volunteers to help us run these programs. Um, and then one of our focuses for this school year is really just helping our students manage um, some of the the difficult parts about being in middle school, right? All of us can remember that in between time of, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure things out. So one of our focuses for this year is really focusing on student behavior and how we can help teach students appropriate ways to deal with, you know, some of the heartache and conflict that comes with, you know, just trying to figure out how we are going to manage as adults. Gotcha. Okay, so lots to pray about. Um, if if anyone here wanted to volunteer, um, they would just call the office or? So there is actually, um, on the Lake County Schools website, there's a, a volunteer button. And so it has each school's volunteer coordinator. Um, and it is from a level one volunteer, it's truly just a few clicks on the computer and agreement to do a background screening. It's very simple. Um, the level two, which is where you're able to supervise children w without the direct supervision of a Lake County employee is a little more detailed, but it's still, there's no cost to you. Um, and the impact that it has on mm -hmm. our schools and our students is immeasurable. Mm -hmm. Your time is something that is so valuable to us, especially during you know peak times when a lot of people are working. So if you have the flexibility in your schedule, we would be so grateful for your help. That's great, that's really good to know, um, very good. Um, I know that here in a couple of weeks or in a few days, maybe we're we're giving uh, we're we're giving you guys some like fruit and stuff. I believe for a, like a teacher breakfast. I think um, so. We're excited to be a part of that. Um, Ms. Trang, you let us know if there's uh, um, anything that we can maybe provide. Some you could send Shelby back to us. Send Shelby back to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Shelby's I know that she is doing director. important, important work, yeah. and um, but I, and I understand it. I get yeah. it. I just adore her with my whole heart, she's and great. so yeah. she is. She's great. She is fabulous. We'll, we'll see what the Lord has to say about that. <laughs> and hard and to compete with him, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're excited, uh, Coach, that uh, James, our, our student ministry, um, he's been uh, able to come out and be a part of that. And and when James when James got here, I was like. Um, we need to get you on the campus. And uh, he's like, we can't do that. I said, well, yeah, we can. He said, well, you can't do that in Washington State. And I was like, well, you can in Florida, brother. We're going to get you. And uh, we'll figure it out. And so, uh, good, good. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's a joy to be able to partner in some ways already, and I, I hope and pray that we can do more. And so we're going to gather tonight, right? We're going to meet here at 630, and then we're going to go out to these various schools. We want you to pick a school um, that you might have um, a, just a general God leaning towards, uh, and we're going to go there. I know my wife and I are going to the elementary school, and James is headed to the uh, high school, and um, I know we got some people headed to the middle school, and we're going to be um, praying, but we're also praying with other churches, too. There'll be other groups um, there, 
And uh, so we're going to pray around those needs right, right there, but we're going to pray for those needs now also. Um, let me ask this question. Do we have any teachers in the room? You're a teacher in the public school system. Great, great. So friends, look around. You see those teachers. Now let me ask this question. Do we have any homeschool parents and teachers in the room? I know we do. Absolutely. And so there's a lot of prayer needed right now. So uh, let's go to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your goodness and your grace. God, we thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you that uh, you have provided in so many ways. Uh, and namely, Lord, through Jesus Christ. You are the sure foundation. And so, God, we look back to what you have done, and we look forward to what you will do. And we are thankful for all things. God, we just lift up Coach Lord to you right now. And I pray, uh, Father, I pray that you would encourage him and strengthen him. God, that you would uh, bring um, vision and passion into his life. And, Father, I, I gratefully thank you, Lord, for what he said. Um, the first question, Lord, he didn't say anything about football. He said we want these men to be uh, beacons of light. And so, Father, I pray that that is, um, that is attainable. Lord, it is attainable, and we pray that that would be the thing. Uh, Father, give him uh, opportunities to, to speak about you and point people, um, point these kids to something bigger than, than sports. And Father, thank you for his influence in those lives. Lord, we thank you for Miss Moses, Lord. And, and uh, just personally, Father, I thank you for her friendship, her, her husband's friendship. And I thank you, Lord, for the times that we've prayed uh, together. And so, Lord, I pray that you continue to encourage her, uh, strengthen that school. Uh, Father, that you would um, encourage the the other administrators and the teachers, Lord. Everybody is fairly excited right now, but Lord, we want to pray for them in, in, at Christmas time as well. We want to pray in January when, the, when, it, when it's getting tough. And so, Father, I pray that uh, they would be strong and faithful. Lord, pray for these kids. Uh, Lord, pray that they would know you and that they would see your light. Uh, Father, we thank you, God, for Miss Frana. And uh, Lord, we pray for grade middle school. We pray, Lord, uh, as that transitional time in middle school, Lord, we pray that uh, you would you would get a hold of kids' hearts and shape their, their emotions. And, Father, I pray that you continue to um, give these uh, principals and, and these teachers just uh, an encouragement to be a, a light for you. Father, I pray that your light and your, your love would reign and rule throughout these campuses. And, Father, we pray, God, that you would continue to protect and keep the, the teachers and campus safe. Uh, Father, we pray for behavior. Uh, on the middle school. We pray for behavior all the way across. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would break into these schools. And Father, that you would encourage the, the teachers and the administrators who, who love you, but Father, they're just not exactly sure how to express that love on campus. I pray that you'd encourage them, uh, equip them, and Lord, just give them opportunities to be that light for you. Father, we pray for the teachers that are in the room. God, thank you for, for their hearts, for, for people, for kids. And Lord, uh, nearly every teacher I've ever talked to does not do it for the paycheck. We know that. And so, Father, thank you that they, they give and they, they sacrifice. And I pray that you'd encourage them and give them uh, uh, strength in you today. For our homeschool parents, Lord, who are navigating all of the education and curriculum, Father, uh, and the behavior in the home and the dynamics that happen there between um, um, parents and kids. And, Father, I pray that you'd give them grace and mercy, uh, Lord, that you'd help to, to lead them and direct them, uh, Father, that their kids would grow to love you above all other things. God, we praise you. We are thankful for what you're doing in our, in our community, and we thank you, Lord, that we can be a small part of that. Uh, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying. Co thank guys, you so thank much you for so having so much. Us. Yes, thanks for coming. Um, I know, Miss Moses, you got to go for sure. Uh, her husband's a pastor, and uh, you guys meet at Groveland Elementary, right? Yeah, fantastic. And um, Coach and Ms. Fran, uh, if you guys are able to stay, uh, you're more than welcome to. If you have to go, we completely understand that. But we want to make sure we uh, at least right now say we love you guys, and uh, you're going to be praying for them. Who else is going to be praying? Amen. All right. Thank you. Well, all right, friends. Um, if you have a copy of God's Word, and I hope you do, um, we are we are jumping out of Proverbs. We've been in Proverbs for several um, for a month now, um, but we are we're making a transition out of Proverbs, and uh, we are going today. We're going to be in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter twenty nine. So, if you have a copy of God's Word, I hope you do. Uh, go ahead and turn there to Jeremiah twenty nine. And um, if you're using an app on your phone, fantastic. That's fine. Um, if you got a copy, you know, a hard copy, that's great as well. Uh, we'll also have some of the verses on the screen here in a little bit. Uh, but Jeremiah 29, uh, it, it ties into what we just did. It ties into what we just, what, what we just did in prayer. And so we're going to highlight that uh, this morning. This idea of living as sojourners or pilgrims, living as exiles. 
And we'll see that in Jeremiah 29, verse 4 through 14. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, are you from Florida? Anybody here from Florida? Like, you were born and raised? Uh, my hand's raised. I was, born, um, I was born up the road in Pine Hills. My mom and dad met in Winter Garden at Lakeview High School. So we've got a handful of from Florida. Um, did, you, did you ever think about the fact that uh, you can tell a lot about a person by where they're from? Yeah? Right? Okay. All right. Like, they don't know how to drive. We figure that out. I'm sorry, that's just a running joke with us. Um, you can tell a lot about. Have you ever traveled? Have you ever traveled? Have you ever been? Uh, have you ever been out of the country? Have you ever been out of the country? Uh, we we went to um, we used to go to Haiti a lot. My my wife and my kids and um, from our church we would go to uh, to Haiti and work at a at an orphanage. And um, you know you never know what you're going to eat, right? Um, we have some retired missionaries in our, in our church, and you, you understand this. Um, the motto of a missionary is, I will go um, where he sends me, and I will eat what they feed me. <laughs> you know, uh, have you ever, you ever been out, you ever traveled? You ever, this is a, a random question. It's, it's kind of a silly question. You ever been on vacation? Yeah, of course. I mean, most, yeah. And so every time we go somewhere, obviously that place is different. So how did you end up here? That's a question. It's a question I've been asking some of our, our new members who have been uh, attending and, and, and coming into the church. Um, last week we baptized um, uh, several, or like three 20-something-year-olds. And then we had the, the engaged couple, if you were here. Uh, you saw uh, Christopher and Adeline, and uh, they're in their young 20s. And um, one of the questions I asked them, I said, why are you here? Why did you come here, like to this church? What, how did you get here? And uh, they gave a great answer. I can save that for, for later. Um, yesterday I did their wedding, and it was beautiful, and it was outside in August, and it was so blistering hot. But <laughs> they're married. God bless them. They're going to the Greek Isles, and they're going to experience a beautiful and a unique culture. How did you get here? How did you get here? So whether or not you're visiting and you're on vacation or you're just here for a short time, you're here. You're here in this location. You know, I, um, my wife and I used to live, like I said, we're from Florida, but we used to live in Canada, in western Canada, and we lived there for several years. And uh, it's a beautiful place and beautiful people and great food, and, and it was a great time. But there was something about coming home. There's something about coming back home. When you fly into Orlando and you come across and you're like, how did we build so many houses around all of these lakes? Like, there's water everywhere. You know, you fly in. And you know you're home when you get off the airplane and you, you go through that little concourse area. And then you get on that tram that goes across. You know you are home when the humidity smacks you in the face like a hot, wet blanket and uh, Buddy Dyer's voice is over the intercom, and you're like, now nah, we're home. There's something about coming home. Well, there's something about being in exile, being a sojourner, being a pilgrim, not being from the location that you have found yourself in. There's something unique about that. And actually, every single one of us, we are that. The Bible speaks about being a sojourner, a pilgrim, or being on, in exile quite a bit. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute in Jeremiah 29. Uh, but it also talks about it in 1 Peter as well and other places in Scripture. And so what we're going to do for the next several weeks is um, we're just talking about what does it look like to live as an exile, to live as a pilgrim, to live as a sojourner. What do we do? What kind of relationships do we need to have? How does that work? And so we're going to, in t today we're in Jeremiah, but the next several weeks we're going to be in 1 Peter. And we're not going to do like we normally do, go verse by verse and chapter by chapter. We're going to look at um, three big buckets in 1 Peter. And then going into September, uh, after Labor Day, we are going to jump in 1 Samuel. And uh, we'll be there for quite some time. It'll be a, a beautiful thing. But an exile, what do we do when we find ourselves someplace that we're not from? And so as a Christian, again, we know that the Bible tells us this. And if you're familiar with Bible study, you know that. Uh, you feel that. If you're a Christian, you feel that. But here's another thing we need to remember. Even if you're not a Christian, 
Even if you're not a believer in Jesus, you don't follow Jesus, you are an atheist, an agnostic, or just whatever, you're not following Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian, you are still an exile. You are still a, a pilgrim, a sojourner. Why is that? Because every single one of us have been created to live somewhere forever. We will live somewhere forever. This is not your home, whether or not you're a Christian or not a Christian. You will live somewhere forever. And I pray that by the end of today's time that you would choose to follow Jesus Christ and be assured that you can live with God forever in a place, a beautiful place called heaven. But none of us, none of us are just, just hanging out. We're all pilgrims. We're all exiles. Now, let's just a little bit of a background for Jeremiah um, right here in, in verse 20, or chapter 29. Um, Jeremiah is writing some letters. Obviously, there's, you know, the book is named after Jeremiah. Uh, he writes several letters throughout chapter 29 that uh, are addressed, throughout through these chapters that are addressed. Again, we're just kind of focusing on the, the, one, or the one aspect of the here in 29. But you need to know this. Uh, Jeremiah is writing to um, the Judeans. So he's writing to, to people from Judah who have been taken captive who have been taken captive into Babylon. So they've been taken captive, and he's writing sometime after 597 B.C., if you're interested in, in historical things like that. Uh, and, and they've been taken there. Some of, some of the people have, were able to stay, um, but then uh, uh, many, many, many have been taken into captivity. Now, that's who he's, that's who he's writing to. You know, and remember this, uh, as Christians, as Christians, we are in Christ, okay? As Christians, we are in Christ. And we are at home in Christ. But also as Christians, we are in transit. And we are not from this place. And so let's see what, um, what um, Jeremiah says. Let's start with verse 4. And we'll work our way through verse 14. And we'll come back and talk about it for just a moment. Uh, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles. I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. Verse 8. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners uh, deceive you, and don't listen to the dreams you elicit from them, for they are prophesying falsely to, to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. In verse 10. For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. All right, for I know the plans, plans for your uh, well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call out to me. You'll call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. This is the Lord's declaration. Who's writing those words? This is the Lord's declaration. And so Jeremiah, is, he's penning a letter to these people who are in exile, who have been taking, uh, taken prisoners and captive, and he's telling them, this is what the Lord is saying to you. This is the Lord's declaration. Declaration. So what I want us to do is think about three ideas here in our remaining time together and how they apply uh, even to what we were just doing, praying for the schools, and how we might would apply these in our lives today. And let's talk about this big idea right here. Um, Jeremiah is writing to people who think they have no future, to those who have no future. And, and he's writing to them, um, and he's telling them this idea. Um, even though you are in exile and most likely feel like you are never going to get out or you are, you are depressed and you are beaten down, he says, I need you to understand this. God is the one who's in control of this. 
God is in control of that's why he says again in verse in verse 4 he said this is what the Lord of armies the God of Israel says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon you see they may have thought that there was another another organization or another group of people or something else that was in control but ultimately the God that we serve he's very sovereign that means he's in control of all things and God is the one who deported them into exile now why would that be encouragement why would it be encouragement because we know the faithfulness of God we know the heart of God you and I have, a, have the complete words of God. We have the scriptures. And for us, we can look at it and say, God is going to be faithful. And so here's something I want us to make sure we understand. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's happening to you. Uh, I know a lot of what's happening to people in the church, but I don't know everything. But you need to know this. God knows, and God is in control. God is in charge. God has not forgotten you. And so he's writing to people who... who who feel like there's no future. Like what happens now? What, what in the world are we going to do now? It reminds me of the words in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, Paul says it like this. It'll be on the screen. From one man he has made every na nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. Who determined those things? God. You see, we, uh, you know, when my, all my years as being a, a student pastor, a youth pastor, I would always tell the kids, you thought your assigned seat was assigned to you by a teacher. No, your assigned seat is assigned to you by God. And you're sitting next to Johnny and Susie because God wants you in that seat. And you have an opportunity to influence Johnny and Susie. That's why you're there. You thought you, thought you chose the job that you're in. But God's got a bigger plan for that. God is the one. You thought you wanted to move into that neighborhood. I don't know why you thought you wanted to move to Groveland. No idea. What in the world? You thought you moved to Groveland because the housing was cheaper. But God has a bigger plan for you. You are here on purpose, for a purpose. And you can trust the heart of God. And so I don't know, again, what might be happening in your life, but it might be tough and difficult. Know this. God is good. God is in control. You have a future. Please do not feel like you have no future. Go ahead and accept and trust the heart of God. He's also writing to people who have a false future. He's writing to people who have a false future. And what, is, what, is, what does that mean, a false future? Because he tells them not to believe the prophets. Don't believe those prophets who are prophesying to you and telling you these things. And one, we learn later uh, some of the things that they were telling them was that this is going to be a short time. You're only going to be here for a couple of years. And what Jeremiah ends up telling them, no, that's not the case. You're going to be there 70 years. 70 years you will be in exile. He's writing to people who have a false future. And so the people that are believing in lies. In verse 10, he tells them again, 70 years. You see, they had a false hope, a false future. Their, their hope was in going back. But God wants them to have hope in today and going forward. And so they would basically do things like this or be encouraged to don't, don't plant gardens, don't build houses. You don't need to do any of that stuff. Don't live in the community, in the city that you're in, in the, in the country that you're in. Don't live, don't, don't do anything. Just hunker down and hide and wait. It's going to be a short trip and you're out of here. Just wait, just hunker down. Just, just don't worry about it. Just get into your little huddle and stay there and insulate yourselves. It's not going to last for very long. But what does he end up telling them? He says, no. He says, no. He says, go and plant gardens, build houses. He says, um, get married, have children, uh, let your, your, you know, your sons find, find wives for your sons, blah, 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 back and forth. What are we talking about? We're talking about living life, right? Being productive in society, living for the glory of God in a place that they have found themselves as exiles one, one very simple reason they needed to have some children 
and have some families is because in 70 years or so, they are going to go back to, uh, to their land. And there needs to be people that go back to the land. And so we need to have children and these things. False future. See, biblical exile, let's see how I wrote it down. Biblical exile is not fighting to get your past back. We need to understand this as Christians. We look at the past, even in our history, in American history, we look at the past and we long for those days. But that is not biblical exile. Biblical exile is not about going back. Biblical exile is about, again, being faithful here and going forward with God. Biblical exile is not a longing for the past. Now, this has become uh, more and more of a, a thought and a, a thing that keeps rushing, again, a thought a rushing, rushing through my mind. As we think even about some of our, some, some of the young adults uh, that we read about or hear about who have just like left the church and, and some, of our, some of my generation and who's kind of the, the popular phrase deconstructed, you know, the, all of those type of things. You know who else deconstructed? Peter deconstructed. Peter, the apostle Peter who was walking with Jesus when Jesus was taken um, captive uh, the night uh, before his betrayal and then a, a little uh, 12-year-old, 13-year-old girl said, hey, aren't you one of them? And he says, no, uh -uh, I'm, I'm not with Jesus. I mean, in a way, he deconstructed. And then he took his friends and went off to go fishing. And they all followed him. And Jesus came and found him, rescued him from his own stupidity and his big mouth, and changed his heart, and he became a powerhouse for the gospel. So, yeah, deconstruction. We see people in the Bible denying Christ, Thomas, Thomas, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. And then he sees Jesus, and he falls on his knees, and he says, my Lord and my God. So these, these deconstruction things have been happening for a long time. It's, it's been happening for a long time. But in our context, we're not going to look back. We're going to be faithful today and push forward in God's, in God's purpose and God's glory. Because here's the thing. There was a point in American history in the past when to be an American was also to be religious. It was seen almost hand in hand as the same thing. Why was that? Who was the enemy back in the 50s and the 40s and the 20s and the 60s? Who was the enemy? It was communism. And communism, by most nature, atheistic. And so as Americans, it was common. I'm not saying this is what you did who are old enough to have been from there. And I'm not saying this is what your parents did. I am saying this is what a lot of our culture did. We're not, we, we, we're Americans because we believe in God. We're not like those communists because they don't believe in God. So we believe in God and we're Americans. That's a cultural Christianity that infected our country. And God is calling us to something better and bigger than that. And what happened in, in recent times? In recent times, who's the enemy now? The enemy are terrorists. And most of them are connected to some form of Islam. And so now it's like they're religious extremists. And so a lot of the young people in our lives are saying, that's, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be connected or identified with religious extremism. And so I don't know what I believe. And so I'm just going to kind of step back a little bit. It is up to us, followers of Jesus, to show them what it means to be a follower and a lover of God. And it is not a longing for the past. It is a faithful um, today and looking forward to God's future. I hope and pray that makes sense. I hope and pray that that connects and resonates. And I hope and pray that we can get a hold of this thing um, in our culture as Christians. We can get a hold of this as how we, how we interact on social media and the things that we say to, to each other and to others who don't believe the same things that you and I would believe. I pray that we get a hold of this and we realize that it is not about a hope in the past. It is about today what God is doing and looking forward to the future and what God will do. That's my prayer. You see, he tells them to plant gardens and build houses and do these things and seek the welfare of the city. What is he telling them to do? It's not unlike what Jesus told us to do. Jesus said, love your neighbors or love your enemies. He, he said radical things. Jeremiah is saying the same thing. What is he doing? He's saying be a peacemaker. 
not a troublemaker. Be a peacemaker. So we're living in exile as followers of Jesus Christ. But we're not called to be troublemakers. We're called to be peacemakers. And so may we have that attitude, making peace wherever we go, being part of the city, part of the community. What else? He said, be praying people, not pessimistic people. Let's be praying people, people who are legitimately praying for the city. You see, I, I, love, I love having been here for three and a half years or so. Um, um, I, I get lots of opportunities to go to the city council meetings. Anybody like going to a city council meeting? That's kind of what I thought you'd say. Uh, sometimes they're exciting. Most of the time they're not. But, uh, you know, that happened like twice a month, and I get to go, and I get to open in prayer. And that's a beautiful thing. And I often, oftentimes I'll step up to the podium, and I'll say something like this. Um, an ancient prophet, an ancient Jewish prophet said in the book of Jeremiah to pray for the welfare of the city. That's what we're doing today. Uh, as a church, we're part of um, the South Lake Chamber of Commerce. I had somebody ask me last night at the wedding, um, and they're like, why would a church be a part of the Chamber of Commerce? Why wouldn't a church be a part of this Chamber of Commerce? Are you serious? The business leaders in our communities are right there, and we get to rub shoulders and have conversations with people, and we're seeking the welfare of the city. And almost every time when I get together in a smaller group, they'll give you an opportunity to speak. You're giving the preacher an opportunity to speak. And I'm like, yes. And so I'll say things like this. Hey, um, we believe that everybody wants to live an amazing life, and life is too short to get it wrong. That's why we've been teaching the words of Jesus for 101 years. And Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. I get to do that in front of all those people. And I get to pray. And I often tell them at these giant um, prayer breakfasts, I'll often say that, you know, we are called to pray for the welfare of the city. And I believe that a healthy faith community and a healthy business community will make for a thriving community. Let's pray towards that end. We've got to have that type of attitude amongst ourselves for the city and the community and the country that we have found ourselves in. And so may we be praying people and not pessimistic people. What does that mean? Let's don't degrade and, and fight and yell. Here's the thing, Christians. Let's just don't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. That might be a mic drop and we'd be done for the day. Let's don't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. I'm not saying let's don't have legislation and let's, let's do those things and run for office and all that. No, praise God. I pray that you will. I pray that you will. But let us be a light shining for the glory of God, not pessimistic, not a troublemaker, but a peacemaker, and showing a better way. You know, the, the Israelites, God's people, they were called to be a light to the nations. And so could it be that even in this time, Jeremiah says, you're going to live this way. Could it be that they would be showing God's light in that difficult moments and that others would come to, to follow the God that they come to follow? Couldn't that happen? Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? What if we walked through our, our, our neighborhoods and we prayed that God would give us opportunities to speak to, the, to our neighbors? Maybe you said, God, God, that neighbor over there, that guy really needs to be saved. <laughs> but then you say, would you allow me to be a part of that story? What if we approached it not making trouble, but making peace? So live your life. Live your life. He says, pray for the, the welfare. The welfare there, that idea is, um, is shalom. It is the, it is the, the peace of the air, the peace that's way bigger than just like, uh, it's like, it's like mental, spiritual, emotional, physical. It is, it is a complete whole um, idea of peace. And it is an amazing thing when he says when, in, when they, when they prosper. So when we pray for these schools, when we pray for the administrators, when we pray for our council members, when we pray for our president and all of those who are in leadership, when we pray for the city, the community, the county, the state, when we pray and God moves in their prosperity, comes our prosperity, our well-being. And praise God that we live in a country called America. Amen? Like, I love our country and the freedoms that we have here, but we cannot turn our country into an idol. 
cannot. We seek God in the moment here. How do we live it out here into the future? How God would be a light in us. One of the things that um, when we were in Canada, my goodness, did you know um, that my Canadian friends, when they were traveling overseas, they would always put a little Canadian flag on their backpack? Not because they're patriotic. Because they didn't want to be confused as being an American. I'm serious. I'm serious. Because there was like this, this world attitude that we were bringing. And I would often tell them, I was like, hey, I am, I am proud to be an American. But I pray that I am not a proud American. Amen? Let's represent Christ in a way that is bringing peace. You know, prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. You know what prayer changes? It changes you. It changes me. It changes us and how we interact with others. Not to mention that God actually moves in prayer. And so, yes, we pray. We pray that there would be legislation and, and, and changes when it comes to abortion. Yes, we pray and we act and we move and we do it in a way that is not a troublemaker but a peacemaker. Prayer changes things. Jesus said, be salt and light. Salt. He didn't say, go and yell at the dead meat. He said, be salt to it. Be salt and light. Here we go. Praying for our enemies helps us see them as more than opponents to overcome. Let it sink in. Praying for our enemies. This is radical stuff when Jesus said this. Praying for our enemies. So here's a question. How do I see people? And I've mentioned this to you before, but how do I see people? Most of us see people in one of three ways. How do I see people? Do I see them as machinery? When I go about my day, do I see people as, a, as machinery? They're just here to serve me. Do I see them as machinery? Do I see them as scenery? Scenery. They're people. They're just in a movie about me. They're just part of the scenery. Or do I see people the way Jesus saw people? As ministry. When Jesus stood over Jerusalem and he wept. He wept for the people. Because he knew, because they were rejecting what God was bringing, he wept over them, and he sought to love them, and he sought to love us by going to the cross for us. How do I see people? Friends, listen, just because you are on your phone, this is not in my notes, so this will get me in trouble. If you're like, that other stuff was in your notes, you're already in trouble. Just because we're on our phones doesn't mean the person on the other side doesn't matter. They're real people. And just because we think we need to blow something up on social media doesn't mean that there's people, there's not people on the other side who are hurting and need to see a better picture of what it means to be a Jesus follower than what we're doing. Some of you might be thinking, this guy has an agenda today. I don't. I really don't. I'm, I'm just nervous for us as a community. I really am. And I'm praying that God will change some things. I, I'm, I'm nervous as we go into another election cycle that as Christians we're going to lose our ever-loving minds. And I, I want to help us process these things by the grace and mercy of Jesus. I just want us to be more like Jesus. I just Forget it. I just want to be more like Jesus. Me. I just want to be more like Jesus. And I pray that you do too. So he's writing to people who who have no hope, writing to people who, who have a false hope. And lastly, he's writing to people who have real hope. He's writing to people who, who absolutely have a future, those who have a true future, a true hope, a true hope. And that true hope is based on God's word. Why? Why would we say that? Why would we say that? It's because he says in verse 10, for this is what the Lord says. He goes against the false prophets, and then he says, this is what the Lord says. Our true hope is found in God's word, in God's word alone. It is found in him, not in a false prophet. Listen, friends, I love, I love you, but there are false prophets on both sides of that aisle. There are false donkeys, and there are false elephants. 
There are false prophets on both sides of the aisle, and we have to be discerning by God's word to know what voice to listen to and what is being, what is being true and told to us. We have to know God's word. And so he's writing to people who have a true future. And how is he doing that as we close some things out? Well, in verse 10, he makes them this promise. When 70 years of for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. And in verse 13, verse 13, he clearly tells them, look at verse 13 if you have it open still. In verse 13, he says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That is the same promise to us today. That we will know God when we want to know God more than anything else in our lives. When we seek him and search him with all our heart, we can know him. And that is the same promise that they have and that we have based on God's word. Now here's a question that you might be asking. And we're going to actually transition to a time of communion together. Here's a question you're going to be asking. Does, does Jeremiah 29, 11 apply to me? For I know the plans I have for you, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. As Christians, we love to co-opt some verses. We, you know, we love Jeremiah 29, 11, and we put it on a coffee cup and a back of our t-shirt. I know the Lord has plans for me, plans for a future and hope, and all the blah, blah, blah. Does that apply to me? Does it apply to you? Or does it only apply to the, these, these Jews who are in exile in Babylon? That's a good question. You know, we, we love to take uh, verses like, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And we, uh, coach, we put them on football jerseys. Or about, or about, like, I can do all things. And that's not really the thing that Paul was talking about, that I can be successful in all these things. He's like, you can do these things in through all of this turmoil and trial because Jesus is with you. Yes. Does Jeremiah 29, 11 apply to me? I know some, this might be your favorite verse, your life verse, 29, 11. It's a good one. But the question is, does it apply? And I'm going to say yes, 110%, friends. It absolutely applies to all of us because it is in Jesus Christ that it applies to us. And every time we receive communion together, we say this. Look at these verses up on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. We're going to read it again here in just a moment. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, look what Jesus says. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. What is, what is it? The cup is what? It is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus is saying, yes, the promises of the Old Testament, the covenant, it is applies to you because I am going to the cross I am shedding my blood for you and because of that you have the inheritance of these promises and that is a beautiful thing so yes yes God does know the plans God does know what's coming he has designed it and it is a good great and beautiful thing for those who have trusted Jesus as their savior that's why second Corinthians um, 120 says it like this for every one of God's promises is yes in him. Therefore, through him, we also say amen to the glory of God. Every single promise that God has promised to the people in the Old Testament through the blood of Jesus Christ is promised to you and I here in the New Testament, trusting Jesus as Savior. That's in part what Romans chapter 8 verse 32 means. Look at Romans 8 32. He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Everything. The everything. There's all that is promised. Yes and amen. It applies to you only through Jesus Christ. And that is a good thing. And I pray that we will see that we have a true future. We have a future. That is absolutely true. That is built on God's word. A true future that is not built on false promises. It is not built on, on idyllic past. It is built on God's word. God's word today and into the future, living for Jesus. Let us be people. People who love the place we live. Serve the place we live. Pray for the place that we live. 
and pray that God would use us to be salt and light in that place. And I pray that you resonate with that. I pray that it makes some of us uncomfortable. And I pray that we would come to understanding how God is moving in our hearts and in this place to direct us into these things. Love where we live. Pray for where we live. You are not here by accident. You are not going through what you're going through by accident. Trust the goodness and the mercy and the grace of Jesus and rest in the promise that Jesus has secured all things for you. Amen? Amen. Hey there, thanks again for downloading or streaming this message. I pray that the Lord will use it to grow you in your faith. I look forward to meeting you one day soon at one of our worship gatherings. It's impossible for us to recreate online what you'll experience when you gather with us in person for worship. If you have any questions, go ahead and text the word online to 352-822-3878. That's online to 352-822-3878. Look forward to meeting you. God bless. Have a great week.